So, so as Anthony said, we're going to talk about Alabama rot tonight, uh, properly known as cutaneous and renal glomerular vasculopathy, or, or CRGV. Uh, and the first thing to say is what that means. Uh, so vasculopathy is obviously a, a pathology of the vessel. Uh, and what we see with this disease process is that pathology of the vessel causing changes in both the skin and the kidney. So what are we going to talk about over the next 45 minutes or so? Uh, well, first off, I want to give you a little bit of background of how I became involved in this disease process and why I'm talking to you about it this evening. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the previous literature, uh, so what was published in the 1980s and 1990s predominantly out of the US, uh, and then I'll tell a fair amount about uh, the cases that we've been seeing, and it's quite a nice summary of 30 uh, of the dogs that we saw with this disease that sadly didn't survive, and then we'll just talk about a little a little bit about the general prognosis for, uh, for this disease. Process. So just first up, a, a definition, uh, and previously we all used to think about um, the terminology for kidney, uh, sudden onset kidney problems as acute renal failure, um, and that was defined as a reduction in the glomerular filtration rate, so the amount of blood passing through uh, the glomeruli over a minute, um, and, and that led to an increase in, in urea and creatinine. So that was really the, the old definition of acute, a reduction in the GFR, with an increase in UMAT because they couldn't use great of the dogs. Nine of the 30 dogs developed systemic signs at the same time as the skin lesions. So they had skin lesions and clinical signs referable to AKI. Uh, and two of the dogs had AKI and then went on and developed skin lesions whilst they were hospitalized. The vast majority of the skin lesions were on the distal limbs. So most of them distal to elbow or stifle. Um, but occasionally we were seeing lesions on the ventrum. Uh, and as I mentioned before, sometimes on the uh, or cavity or muzzle. Uh, and again, if we look at this picture top right, Right, not necessarily lesions that you would always be overly concerned by, so just reasonably subtle uh, erosive lesions that did progress, uh, but this was their first appearance. Uh, half of the dogs had more than one lesion, but it does mean that uh, half the dogs only had one lesion, which could potentially be missed. So I would urge you to very thoroughly uh, examine any dogs that you suspect have CRGV, because there might be a, uh, a small lesion hiding somewhere. And sometimes, but not always, the lesions were painful on palpation, um, because most of the lesions were on the limbs. Some of the dogs were lame. Uh, as you saw from uh, the panel of images that I showed you earlier on, the appearance was quite variable. Uh, so sometimes just a relatively innocuous superficial erosion, uh, as on that picture bottom left, uh, and sometimes a, a well demarcated ulcerative lesion, uh, or sometimes more generalized erythema uh, and ulceration of the limb, uh, as we saw in, in the Pug Agatha. If I look through the clinical notes that were sent to me by vets who either sent me cases or, or sent me tissue, initially the lesions were often attributed to wounds, bites, stings, or a focal dermatitis, a hotspot type lesion. Um, lesion size was quite variable from half a centimetre up to around five centimetres, uh, and six of those 30 dogs developed a new limb or oral lesion whilst hospitalised. So again, just a good reminder to make sure we're examining these patients at least daily uh, whilst they're hospitalised if we're managing the uh, acute kidney injury. So here's the summary of the clinical signs. So 30 of the 30 dogs had skin lesions. Uh, 20 of the dogs were anorexic and vomiting. Uh, about the same were lethargic and hypothermic. The, the hypothermia was mild, so the um, average rectal temperature of the hypothermic dog was 37.8 from memory, so it was only a mild hypothermia. A little bit of lameness. Um, a small proportion of the dogs were icteric uh, and a small proportion of the dogs were pyrexic uh, and on of the pyrexic dogs the average rectal temperature is just under 40. So what about ClinPath in these dogs? So is there anything that can help us uh, if we're presented with a dog with a skin lesion that might push us more towards CRGV uh, rather than thinking that it might just be a local dermatitis? So seven of the dogs were anemic uh, at first presentation, relatively mild, uh, and a further eight dogs became anemic. 
15 of the dogs were thrombocytopenic at presentation, so half of those 30 dogs were thrombocytopenic, uh, and their average platelet count was just under 50 times 10 to the 9 per litre, where the bottom of the normal reference range is around 150. So these dogs probably aren't quite at a level where, we're, where they're going to start spontaneously bleeding. We often think of around 30 times 10 to 9 per litre for spontaneous hemorrhage, but they're not too far away. Uh, and, an, and, an, and an additional four dogs became thrombocytopenic during hospitalisation. So that's almost 20 of the 30 dogs with a, a pretty significant thrombocytopenia at some point during their illness. Uh, 26 of the dogs were azotemic at presentation, uh, an average creatinine pretty big of 476, uh, and the rest were non-azotemic at presentation, but they developed azotemia pretty quickly. Uh, almost a third of the dogs were hyperbilirubinemic at presentation, uh, pretty mild if we look at the average, um, but the uh, top end of the range is, is pretty big, uh, and a further four of them developed uh, hyperbilirubinemia during hospitalization. Now, we don't know for sure what the mechanism of that is, um, but if we're assuming that the anemia in these dogs might be related to uh, a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, so the red cells being damaged as they're forced past those clots, those small clots in the blood vessels, then that might be the origin of the hyperbilirubinemia as well, as those red cells are damaged. So what did we test for uh, in these dogs with uh, CRGV? Uh, well, we looked for lepto in a fair proportion of them. Uh, we did uh, serology, uh, so looking at antibody titers in 15 of the dogs, uh, and 10 of the 15 uh, had negative lepto antibody titers. Five of them had positive titers, but the titers were very low. So we normally would be looking for a titer of around 1 in 1,600 uh, as a single titer to definitively diagnose leptospirosis, but those five Five dogs that have positive titers were all one in 100, one in 200, uh, and probably just related to vaccination. Uh, a few of the dogs had a bit of lepto urine PCR, uh, it's negative, uh, and we did something called FISH uh, in seven other dogs, so that stands for uh, fluorescent in situ hybridization, uh, and basically that's where you use um, fluorescent probes or markers to look for bacterial. DNA sequences, and, and interestingly, so sorry, you're doing that in uh, either kidney tissue or, or liver tissue, and interestingly, six of the dogs were positive, so that means we were seeing leptospirosis organisms in six of these dogs in their liver and or kidney, but what we know from uh, stuff that's been published previously is that dogs can be asymptomatic maintenance hosts for lepto, so they can have a little bit of lepto uh, kicking around but not be clinically affected by it. So why is this not lepto? We've got dogs with acute kidney injury, lepto is always up there near the top of the differential list for any dog we see with acute kidney injury, so why doesn't the presentation of CRGV dogs fit with lepto? Uh, well first up, the histopath doesn't really fit, so thrombotic microandropathy is not something uh, that is uh, normally reported with leptospirosis. Um, skin lesions aren't normally reported with leptospirosis, uh, and a fair proportion of dogs with lepto will survive their disease process. Uh, so somewhere in the region of 70 to 85 percent of dogs with lepto will, will survive, and that certainly isn't what we're seeing with these CRGV dogs, where the mortality rate is much, much higher than that. So what additional testing did we do? You know, we, we'd identified that these dogs had CRGV. Uh, they had Alabama rot, and it, was, it looked exactly the same as these greyhounds in the 1980s and in the 80s and 90s. Uh, loads of people had done lots of testing looking for the underlying cause, and they haven't found it. And we thought, well, hey, science has moved on a little bit. Let's have, a, let's have another look. Uh, so we looked for a few different things. We looked for circa virus, which somebody had isolated um, from dogs with vascular disease uh, of unknown etiology previously, and we couldn't find it. Uh, we did viral metagenomics, so looking for viral genetic material. Uh, we looked for that. We looked for virus in various different organs, didn't find any. Uh, we looked for bacterial genetic material using these 16S RNA directed probes and again we looked for bacteria in various organs and didn't find it. Uh, a few people threw out the possibility of Lyme's disease, didn't really fit the clinical picture but hey we tested for it anyway, it was negative. Uh, we looked for heavy metals in the kidneys, could this be uh, something toxic that are picking up in the environment, so, so things like lead and cadmium and arsenic and didn't find it. Uh, and then one of the commercial labs offers some urine toxicology and there's not a huge amount on there that would cause acute kidney injury apart from ethylene glycol but we thought hey let's let's check it and nothing came up. 
So in short, uh, at the moment, we don't know what the cause of uh, Alabama rot in the UK is. Uh, as some of you may have seen, there's been a fair amount of media interest in this disease.